April 24th is the Space Day of China, said to memorialize the successful launch of China's first man-made Earth satellite, Dongfang Hong-1, 52 years ago. Since Wan Hu attempted to use a chair attached with 47 large rockets to fly to the sky, humans have continued the pace to explore the universe. We dig out the past of the universe to look back to our own origins and we seek for the future of it to touch on the future of human destiny. For the past hundreds of years, human beings have been dreaming of venturing into space. From the moon to Mars, space has held a perpetual allure for humans. And as human footprints approach Mars, we're getting closer, more than ever before, to unraveling the greatest of mysteries in human history. The transformation of human civilization in space is already underway. Together with scientists, astronauts, museum curators, and sci-fi writers, we're here to explore the human fascination behind our journey into the universe. Welcome to the Sky Talk TV Forum, presented by the New Center of China National Space Administration, CGTN Think Tank, National Communications Center for Science and Technology, and Wenchang International Aerospace City. I'm your host, Yang Zhao, from CGTN. Mars has often been called the Earth's sister planet, but the two siblings have different destinies. Mars now is the cold, dry desert planet, while Earth is the planet thriving with life. As humans continue to develop technology for space travel, we're getting closer to understanding some of the secrets of our mysterious neighbor Mars. What can the red planet tell us about the past and the future of Earth? How far are we from sending astronauts to Mars? Zhang Rongqiao, chief designer of China's first Mars mission, and Amitabha Ghosh, chair of the Science Operations Working Group on Mars Exploration Rover Mission, share their perspectives. Let's now turn to them. 朋友们，大家好，我是中国首次火星探测任务工程总司。Good reset. In 1903, Tsiolkovsky put forward a rocket equation which make us out of the cradle of the Earth become a reality. It has been 120 years since this person published this formula, and more than 60 years since the first man-made Earth satellite was launched on October 4, 1957. 100 years is a lifetime for us as each individual, but compared with the 1.4.6 billion years of Earth's history, it's only a moment. Yet, we human beings have not only stepped out of the Earth's cradle, but also have continued to write new hats into space. The successful launch of the world's first man-made Earth satellite in 1957 marks the beginning of the space age of mankind and set the first milestone for human space exploration. In the past 60 years, following the development law of from near orbit to farther orbit, from the unmanned mission first and then to the manned mission, mankind has achieved missions of manned flight around the Earth, unmanned lunar exploration, and manned landing on the moon. Today, we have reached all planets and the major types of small celestial bodies in the solar system. After nearly six decades of space exploration through close-range remote sensing of extraterrestrial objects, in situ detection and laboratory analysis of real samples, mankind has been able to answer the fundamental questions like what it is, where does it come from, where it's going, and what does it have to do with us? And many important scientific discoveries have been made on the basic issues of the universe, enabling mankind to gain new knowledge and discoveries about the mysteries of the universe, broaden knowledge and enhancing capabilities, expanding the scope of human activities and promoting the progress of human civilization. Space exploration is not just a scientific or technical activity. It is endowed with more connotations and missions and has a wide range of 
influence in such fields as science, technology, human resources, economy, and people's ideology and culture. It is also because of the wide range of influence of space exploration that mankind has made the return of samples from Mars or even a mined landing on Mars a future development goal. China's space activities have also followed the same development path. On April 24, 1970, the Dongfang Hongwan satellite was launched. On October 15, 2003, Yang Liwei orbited the Earth. On October 24, 2007, Chang'e 1 successfully launched. China has made remarkable achievements in space development. To go out of the Earth's moon system and enter more distant deep space is the dream of several generations of Chinese space people and an inevitable choice for China's space development. China's first Mars exploration mission after a decade of planning demonstration, mission design, engineering development, and mission launch was successfully launched on July 23, 2020, after 202 days of Earth-Mars transfer and 93 days of Mars orbit, our rover Zhurong landed safely on May 2015, 2021 in the pre-selected landing zone in the a southern part of the Martian Utopia plane and set foot on Mars on May 22, 2021, achieving the goal of orbiting, landing, and roving in one mission successfully. Go beyond the Earth's moon system. Why are we aiming at Mars? Why Mars has become the focus? of deep space exploration today. As a close neighbor of the Earth, the farthest distance between Earth and Mars is 400 million kilometers. With our existing space technology, Mars can be reached in about seven months. Such a mission cycle is more appropriate. In addition, its natural environment is the most similar to Earth. So whether it is robotic exploration or future human landing on Mars, it is easier to adapt to the Mars environment. Therefore, technical considerations such as accessibility and environmental adaptability are one of the factors. Another factor is from the perception of scientific research. Mars is considered an important research target for understanding the evolution of Earth and the planets in the solar system. The existence of water and life on Mars, as well as the condition to support life, has been the focus of human attention. There are many similarities between Mars and the Earth. Whether Mars is the future or the past of Earth is also an important question to be studied and answered by human beings. In addition, mankind are always dreaming of finding a new home outside the Earth. So the knowledge of gravity, magnetic field, atmosphere, and the material composition of Mars has become the most basic knowledge for mankind to understand Mars. China's first Mars exploration mission focuses on these scientific issues, with seven scientific payloads on the orbiter and six payloads on the rover. Through orbiting and roving, the mission will carry out all-round and multi-factor exploration of Mars, topography, surface material composition, subsurface substructural structure, surface physical field, and Mars-based environment, expecting to contribute Chinese strands to human understanding of Mars by interpreting the acquired scientific exploration data. Exploring the vast universe will be an endless journey for a human being. We have drawn up a roadmap for the development of planetary exploration. In the future, we will carry out the Tianwen 2, 3, and 4 mission and conduct asteroid sampling, Mars sampling, and Jupiter system exploration. Thus, making China's contribution to revealing the mysteries of the universe and making progress of human civilization. Exploring the universe is the common cause of mankind. We are committed to innovation-driven development. 
guided by the needs of scientific exploration and the development of engineering technology, follow the purpose of peaceful use of outer space and the promotion of human civilization and social progress, and based on the principle of openness, cooperation, and sharing, and within our capabilities. We are willing to carry out extensive cooperation exchanges with international colleagues, including selection of scientific targets, selection of payloads, joint development of subsystems and system levels, mutual support of measurement and control resources, and sharing the scientific data. I hope that scientists and engineers in the field of deep space exploration all around the world will join hands to advance this great cause so the human footstep into deep space will go faster and further. Thank you. Hokonchi 分析头系统器在联合研制Hello, Dr. Jung. Um, this is um, Amitabh Ghosh. Um, I'm a Mars scientist um, based out of Washington, DC. Um, I was the Science Operation Working Group Chair for, for the Mars Exploration Rover mission. Um, it's my pleasure to be in this discussion with you. Mars has been a very special planet for the human race. For um, hundreds of years, uh, human beings have been fascinated by Mars. Maybe it started with the discovery of canals, what we thought canals um, maybe 400 years ago. Um, and then it continued with our fascination of, with Mars in terms of um, science fiction. So science fiction brought this idea of Mars where little teen men are roaming around and there is a companion life form to Earth. So, so this was the past and in the very recent times, if you remember um, in 1996, so, you know, I was a young graduate student and, you know, we used to discuss, um, could life um, survive in a meteorite that is brought to earth? And around that same time in 1996, there was the huge outcry about a meteorite picked up from, um, Antarctica, which came from Mars, which showed some purportedly nano fossils. And so everybody was fascinated. Um, so there was, it was on the front pages of most newspapers. Mars is a place where at least microscopic life could have existed. And so the very fact that, you know, we look up at the sky and there are a um, trillion, trillion stars which is one followed by 24 zero stars. And what is, the ex what is the possibility that only Earth has life? And so could Mars be a place where there could be life as well? I think that is what drove the average science enthusiast or the average person um, around the world um, to this allure of Mars. So I think we are still there. And, and at that point in 1996, if you ask me what are the chances of finding life on Mars, I would have um, said that it's very little. But now um, this intervening 25 years of discovery uh, has shown Mars to be a much Earth-like planet. And at least it was an Earth-like planet maybe uh, 4 billion years ago when it formed. 
So it's a, it's very fascinating when Mars and Earth formed around 4.5 billion years ago. Um, both uh, formed around the same time. You know, maybe the Sun formed a hundred million years before, and then both these we call terrestrial planets formed. Um, the fascinating thing was Earth was very volcanic and very hot, and it could not have su supported life. But Mars, in contrast, had a lot of water, which meant that there was like an Earth-like condition on Mars, the, like the present Earth-like condition. There were catastrophic floods, there were rivers, there were oceans. Um, and so today, if you ask me, I think there's a much greater possibility of finding life on Mars. And the second reason for that is um, in 1996, we had no idea that life could e exist in extreme environments. So since then, there has been studies which have shown that life can exist, for example, in, in um, hydrothermal vents below the ocean where the uh, temperatures are very high or it can exist in Antarctic ice cores. So life doesn't need a very comfortable environment. It can, it does exist in very hostile environments. So if Mars um, had a hostile environment, it may still be able to harbor past life or maybe even present life. So, um, so I think that is what the, the public and the scientists are excited by the possibility of finding life. And if we do find life, it will change um, a lot of things that the human race thinks about itself. For starters, we are no longer the sole occupants of the universe. There's a companion life form um, across just six months away. So um, one of the um, questions um, I, uh, I would, I li liked Dr. Jung's question uh, that is Mars the past or the future? And I think it's a fascinating question. And I think we are all trying to understand that. So what has changed in the um, last maybe 10 years is space travel has become affordable primarily because of SpaceX and Elon Musk um, uh, developing reusable vehicles and different strategies to um, uh, lower the cost. So the journey to Mars, um, maybe if you ask me 20 years back uh, with human beings would have taken maybe uh, $500 billion or maybe even a trillion dollars. Today, um, Elon Musk and Starship, uh, are they, uh, sorry, Elon Musk and SpaceX are developing this uh, vehicle called Starship, which will um, perhaps lower the cost to a few million dollars, which is huge. A few million dollars is probably, you know, the cost of taking an airplane or a Boeing 747 between Washington and Beijing a few times. So it's a very, very affordable, perhaps a 1000% decrease in cost or even more. Um, so that changes the game completely. And um, there would still have been skeptics who would have said, well, the Starship development will take time, it's not going well, but you know, it is going well. And uh, in, in June, he will test this vehicle um, for the first time, uh, um, take it to orbit and then perhaps by next year they will take this vehicle test it uh, by sending it to the moon and my estimate is by the end of this decade we will have a human mission to mars on the starship so that is where the fascinating question lies is mars the past or the future and i think it's the future so once you can economically transport humans to mars then the problem of staying there is not as difficult. People stay in Antarctica here um, uh, in 365 days a year um, for many, many years. So all you need is a habitation module. You need a, a pressure and temperature controlled environment, which, is, which shields from um, cosmic rays. And then you need uh, probably a water 
a source of water for human needs and source of oxygen, um, which um, the last rover mission showed that you could um, make oxygen on Mars. So, so once this reliable transportation and not just reliable, affordable transportation uh, develops, then there'll be much more um, going back and forth between Earth and Mars. Uh, there will be perhaps a, a scientific base on Mars. Um, so this is absolutely going to happen in the next 20 years. Now, beyond that, will there be commercial activity on Mars? That is what we don't know. See, you see, to get commercial activity on Mars, one of two things has to happen. Either an average person on Earth will say that, well, I will take a lifetime, once in a lifetime vacation to Mars for say $100,000 or even $50,000. So that is one way. So there'll be many, many tens of thousands of people who will take this trip. And so that will create an industry. The other is, is there any mineral or material on Mars which we need on Earth, but it's very, very expensive. Um, so it is almost cheaper to get it from Mars. So for example, you know, um, yesterday um, I had um, say uh, lamp and it came in from Australia, but it came in through this very economical sea route on a ship. And so it was still economically competitive to buy something from Australia in contrast to getting something from um, say a farm nearby. So in, in similar case, I'm giving you an example. So you say you need nickel to make electric vehicles uh, and the cost of nickel right now is probably more than $110,000 per ton. Now, if you can get this nickel from Mars and I'm not at all implying that you can uh, at a much cheaper price, then it would make sense. But I think we are very far away from uh, getting minerals from Mars or even from asteroids. So I think after 10 or 20 years, after we have this permanent scientific base on Mars paid for by taxpayers, that um, we will uh, probably stagnate and be there for a while. Because one of the things about Mars is, uh, I think people do not understand, it's very different going to this um, International Space Station, um, which is just 200 miles away or 250 miles away and going to the moon, which is less than half a million miles away to Mars, which is more than 200 million miles away. So it takes three days to go to the moon. Um, it takes a few hours to go to the International Space Station, but it takes seven months to go to Mars. That too, when it's on the same side of the sun as Earth, and it could be on the other side of the um, sun. So, so that is one of the main drawbacks um, uh, of why uh, eventual plan of settling on Mars might not exist, succeed. Uh, and the other drawback is, um, I think uh, if the human body is not adapted for either low gravity um, journeys or no gravity situations. And so our body does not hold up well. So there is no easy answer. See, all these astronauts who go, they can stay there for maximum maybe one year or six months. It's, it's not a comfortable situation, but to go to Mars and come back, you will need probably um, one year, six months or even more. So how will the human body physically withstand this or even more importantly, how will we mentally um, absorb this huge um, isolation? See, humans, after all, are social creatures. So if you put them in a can and you send them to space, then after a while, your mind will um, react and will not be, not be fine. So that's, I think these are the hurdles that the human race will finally have to come to terms with when they want to reach out to, the, to, the, to outer space and start traveling within the solar system. Thank you, Dr. John and Dr. Goff for bringing us that insight. 
As humans continue to explore outer space, it's also necessary to trace back to the root of our exploration spirit. Since ancient times, humans have used the position of the stars to keep track of time and forecast weather. How else has astronomy been used throughout our history? Let's hear from Shen Jixiang, president of the Chinese Society of Relics, who was also the sixth director of the Palace Museum in Beijing, and Julia Knights, deputy director of the Science Museum in London. They will walk us through how science explorations has impacted the development of human civilization. Greetings to you all. My name is Shen Jixiang. Very glad to participate in this year's Space Day of China. Last year, at the opening ceremony of the Space Day held in Nanjing, as the award presenter, I got an opportunity to meet many experts and scholars in the space industry, learned a lot of knowledge about space, and were touched by the space spirit of China. All of these made me very excited. This year, appointed as the ambassador of this event, I understand I'm shouldering more responsibility with a heavier task to promote China's space industry together with all of you. I grew up in Beijing, and when I was a teenager, I enjoyed looking up at the stars just like everyone else. Back then, the city of Beijing was not as brightly lit as it is today, so the stars in the night sky were particularly brilliant and fascinating. In April 1970, I was in the countryside of Hubei province when Dongfang Hong Wan, China's first man-made satellite, was launched successfully. This great national rejoicing news also inspired me to study harder and build our motherland. Later, I studied in the suburbs of Beijing for eight years as a worker, working for a scientific research institute which developed integrated circuits for radio devices. I have witnessed that people have made a great contribution to the development of the motherland in terms of science and technology. After studying abroad, returning to China, I started my career in the field of the urban space and also worked in cultural heritage conservation and museum. You might wonder what cultural heritage and museum work has to do with aviation industry. In the past, I thought there was no connection. But with the accumulation of my working experience, I found that in the history of Chinese civilization for more than 5,000 years, the ancient Chinese people made many remarkable achievements in the fields of astronomy and science and technology, which are the space genes in Chinese traditional culture. Probably be, the ancient people were more enthusiastic than us in observing the universe and guiding their production and life by observing and recording astronomical phenomena. For example, 5,300 years ago, the people of the ancient state of Liangzhu observed astronomy at the altar of Liang, Yaoshan Mountain for choosing the site of their capital city and then built a massive ancient city. And also during the Western Zhou Dynasty, the Usu took the a middle of heaven and earth as the astronomical observation center in order to choose the location of the capital city and also carry out a large scale science shuttle observations throughout the country, leaving the mass of observing shuttles in the book Rites of Zhou and Guo Shou Jing, a scientific in the Yuan Dynasty, built a stargazing station in Dengfeng, Henan province, and organized nationwide astronomical observation activities. And that was from the South China Sea to Siberia, and a total of 27 observation points were established. Today, Beijing Ancient Observatory, located in the southwest side of Jianguomen, is believed to be one of the oldest and best preserved astronomical observatories in the world. This observatory, which engaged in the astronomical observations for nearly 500 years from AD 1442 to 1929, not only reflects the achievements of the development of ancient Chinese astronomy, also served as a historical witness of cultural exchange between the East and the West. The Palace Museum where I worked, also known as the Forbidden City, is endowed by ancient China's astronomers and with cosmic scientific they also believe to be the a very important assets 
if you look at the planets, the a center of the a forbidden city are the whole of a supreme harmony, the whole of the a central harmony, and the whole of preserving a harmony, all of which have the Chinese character harmony in their names. It shows that a harmonious world can only be realized by living in harmonious with nature, treating each other equally and nicely, and keeping one's heart in peace. The three main halls form a clear central axis, which extended north to the Bell and Drum Towers and the south to the Yongjing Gate, a 7.8 kilometer central axis of Beijing. On both sides of this axis, sacrificial buildings such as temples and altars to the heaven, earth, the sun, the moon, mountains, rivers, storm, and clouds are arranged, as well as a large range of the asymmetrical, gentle, and open urban pattern. This is the social order established by the Chinese people after learning the natural laws of the universe. In 1709, the north-south central axis running through Beijing was determined as the prime meridian, namely zero degree line. It was actually a reaffirmation of the ancient Chinese notion of a geographic centrality in an astronomical and a geographical science. It was 175 years earlier than the International Conference in 1884, which adopted the meridian of a Greenwich Observatory. Today, the Beijing Central Access will be declared as a world cultural heritage. Throughout the history of Chinese civilization, astronomical observation and the calendar are inseparable. China has always been ahead of the world in revealing the movement laws of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Guo Shoujian, a scientist in the Yuan Dynasty, formulated the Shoushi calendar or the season granting calendar, which determined that the length of the tropical year was 365.2425 days, only 25.92 seconds of the current measurement of the year, and the same as that determined by the Gregorian calendar. It was obtained more than 300 years earlier. Most of the Chinese traditional festivals are originated in ancient times and related to the astronomical calendar, the Spring Festival, Lantern Festival, Qingming Festival, Dragon Boat Festival, and Odis, you name it, carried the cultural and the natural connotations. They are closely related to people's real life today and together form the cultural memory and the root of Chinese nation. In ancient time, people took the stars as reference and invented the navigation technology of leading the stars across the ocean, which extended the maritime silk road directly to Africa. Today, China's Beidou satellite navigation system provides all weather high precision positioning and navigation services to the world, proving that China's space science and technology has reached the advanced international level. For a long time, there has been a cognitive mistake that ancient people, ancient China is strong in culture but weak in science and technology. In fact, there are many inventions in China besides the four great inventions. Since the beginning of the 21st century, the State Department of Cultural Relics has organized and implemented two major cultural projects. One is the Chinese Civilization Source Exploration Project, which focuses on the origin of Chinese civilization. Apart from archaeology and ancient literature research, ancient astronomy is also a very important field of study. Today, China's archaeologists and historians have demonstrated development of China's 5,000-year civilization with countless evidence. Another project is the Compass Plan, funding and displaying the value of ancient Chinese inventions and creations, explores and sorts out the cultural heritage of ancient Chinese inventions and creations, and publish a list of important scientific and technological inventions, including astronomical records showing the actual ordinary wisdom of the ancient Chinese. Ancient China not only made great achievements in the field of astronomy, but also had extensive exchanges with countries around the world. The collection of cultural relics in the Palace Museum includes a rich collection of astronomical instruments from the Qing Dynasty, such as those made by the Royal Workshop, tributes brought by the missionaries or foreign missions. Celestial instruments and observation instruments are included. 
China's space industry constantly draws nourishment from traditional Chinese culture, from Chang'e and Yutu to Tiangong and Tianwen, and to China's first Mars rover. Zhurong, which was named at the opening ceremony of last year's China Space Day. They are all full of connotations of traditional Chinese culture. At the moment, we're still immersed in joy of a complete success of the Shenzhou 30-month space flight mission and the safe return of our three astronauts to the motherland. Chinese astronauts have carried out spacewalk, which is a new milestone in the history of China's space development and of epoch-making significance. The ancient Chinese dream of flying into the sky has finally come true, and space flight has lit up people's dreams. At present, dozens of asteroids discovered around the world have been named after outstanding Chinese people who have made tremendous contributions to the country and the nation. From the ancient scientists such as Zhu Chongzhi and Zhang Heng to the two bombs, one satellite heroes such as Qian Xuesen and Sun Jiadong, as well as great figures of the country such as Yuan Longping and Tu Yuyu. And it's also worth being proud that there are also outstanding representatives of Chinese architecture, uh, Wu Liang Yu star and Zhang Jin Tiu star in space. On April 12, 2022, General Secretary Xi Jinping inspected the Wenchang Space Launch Site in Hainan Province, a holy land of the spirit of mind space flight, witnessing the height of the development of the Chinese nation and the human civilization. Both the space base and the launch tower are great heritage of the 20th century and 21st century, so we need to protect today for tomorrow. Looking back on history, every development and the progress of space industry highlights the value of human civilization. Every small step taken by space heroes is a giant leap forward for human civilization. The solid footprint step by step will become a cultural heritage integrated in the blood of Chinese nation and into the genes of Chinese civilization and become the pride of future generations of China. Thank you. Welcome to the Science Museum in London the home of human ingenuity and innovation. The Science Museum is one of the five science museums in our Science Museum group in the UK. Our collections contain millions of amazing and genuine objects from the fields of science, technology, engineering, mathematics and medicine. I'm standing in our Exploring Space Gallery, which reveals wonder around how humanity across the globe has reached out into space. China National Space Administration's Moon and Mars exploration projects in the past few years have opened up more possibilities. We will always endeavor to tell a global story to our international audience. In our China Lates Evening event, we shone a spotlight on the scientific side of China and our audience was super impressed by China's space achievements. And before we can physically travel to Mars and back this autumn at the Science Museum, we will invite visitors with our major new exhibition entitled Science Fiction Voyage to the Edge of Imagination. Along with an accompanying book published with the exhibition, we aim to include and celebrate Chinese science fiction from Liu Cixin's The Three-Body Problem, The Wandering Earth to Stanley Chen's The Waste Tide, and imagine where the science can take us next. Will we ever live on Mars? And will there be a moon base? And will indeed space tourism become a reality for the many? human ingenuity will surely reach still further into space in the years to come. Thank you, Mr. Shun and Dr. Nice. What a fascinating discussion. We have now discussed the past and future of space exploration. So let's hear from someone who has physically visited space. It's a long and arduous journey to become an astronaut. What empowered these two brilliant female astronauts to reach their dreams, and what difficulties did they face along the way? I can't wait to introduce Chinese astronaut Wang Yaping, also the first Chinese woman to conduct a spacewalk, and Naoko Yamazaki, a former astronaut of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. 
They will share their unique experiences in space. And Wang Yaping just returned to Earth last week and recorded the following video for us in China's Tiangong Space Station. Hello, everyone. I'm Shenzhou 13 astronaut Wang Yaping. First of all, I would like to warmly congratulate the grand opening of China's Space Flight and Cultural and Art Exploration Forum. I'm honored to share with you as an invited guest. In 2003, when I saw Shenzhou 5 Korean astronaut Yang Liwei into space, my space dream quietly took root in my heart. I must become a female astronaut in space. However, the space environment will not change because of the arrival of women, nor will it lower the threshold because of women. So I have raised my requirements for myself on the content, standard, and intensity of training. I firmly believe that dreams are like stars in the universe, seemingly out of reach, but as long as you work hard, you will be able to touch them one day. As a young person, you must dare to have a dream, be brave enough to pursue it, and be diligent enough to fulfill it. With wisdom and hard work to build your own dream spaceship, you will definitely be able to usher in the launch moment of your dream and fly to the vast starry sky that belongs to you. When I was a child, I looked up the stars, dreaming that one day I could fly into the sky and pick the star with my bare hands. And now I myself right now enter the space station and become a space lecturer, finally realized my dream for many years. This hard won joy and glory belongs not only to myself, but also to everyone who builds space and loves space. Now I'm about to complete my space journey back to Earth. Before the trip, my daughter wants me to pick a star for her. A child's tender request, but it represents the human longing for space. One universe, one dream. The vast stars belong to everyone. The space industry is the common cause of all mankind, and exploring the vast universe is the common dream of all. As former American astronaut Katie Coleman once told me that when you look out the window at the stars and see our planet, remember that billions of women are looking out the window through your eyes. Space flight is a romantic and a great cause, and I'm very honored and happy that I chose space flight as my career to be the closest person to the stars. Space flight allows dreams to shine into reality. I hope that every woman can have a piece of the starry sky of her own and be most brilliant of her own. In recent years, the rapid development of China's space industry, Beidou satellites, the a the a Xihe exploration set, the first sun observation satellite Xihe, and the Zhurong Mars rover. The journey to the universe shines with the glory of the Chinese nation. We are happy to share our experience and the fruit of space exploration with other countries. We will continue to work together with friends around the world for the development of world space industry to contribute more Chinese wisdom, Chinese so solutions, Chinese strengths to the building of a community with a shared future for mankind. Finally, I wish you all success in the Space Illuminate Stream, China Space and a Cultural Forum. And thank you all. Let's see you on Earth. Hello, I am Naoko Yamazaki, a former Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency's astronaut and a representative director of Space Port of Japan Association. I stayed on board the Space Shuttle and International Space Station, ISS, for 15 days in 2010. When I was a small child, I was very interested in watching the stars and was inspired by lots of sci-fi movies and books. However, it was not until when I entered a junior high school that first Japanese astronauts were selected. So I did not think of becoming an astronaut as my career in my childhood. 
So my message for you is do not limit yourself by what you see right now. There are lots of possibilities ahead of you beyond your imagination. When I entered the ISS and my dream came true, I was very excited and thankful for my family and so many people who supported me. Uh, it was a little bit different from my original expectation in my childhood. Because in my childhood, I dreamt of traveling to space beyond the solar system. And the ISS was only about 400 kilometers high from the ground. It was still very close to the Earth. However, the views of the Earth from there are so breathtaking and much more beautiful than I had expected. When I reached space for the first time after the launch, somehow I felt very familiar and comfortable in microgravity. At school, I learned we human beings, as well as all the creatures, are made of the same things, same stuff as stars and planets, like oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen, and so on. We humans are siblings of these stars and planets and part of the universe. So flying to space seemed to me like visiting my own hometown. Before going to space, I always thought space was the most incredible place and the most desirable place to reach out. But when I first saw our home planet from space, I thought, oh, maybe it is the Earth that is special and unique in the vastness of the universe. I could see the shining blue of the ocean and the clouds uh, moving during the day. I felt like it was alive and it is more beautiful than I had imagined. On board the ISS, I worked with a lot of tension because it is just paper thin wall which separates us inside the spacecraft from the harsh space environment. However, I did not feel lonely because there are so many dedicated people on the ground who supported the mission and I could communicate with them and my family while I was in space. Usually, training takes years. While I was trained, I gave a birth to my first child, and I had 11 years of training before going to space. However, I did not think of giving up my career. For space program, is a wide teamwork and I was honored to be a part of it. We encourage each other very often. For example, former NASA female astronaut Katie Coleman often encouraged me by saying, it is challenging to pursue our career in a long term. However, it is not impossible. I appreciated her words and now I'm honored to encourage the younger generations, especially young women. I'm glad the spirit of challenges is passed on from generation to generation. And another important thing is to stay up with your dream, because dreams gives you lots of power. For example, in the ocean, if you only look up close, the waves will intoxicate you. However, if you look at the distant horizon, you will never lose your sight of where you are going. I expect continuing space exploration gives us more insights of our home planet. When I looked at the Earth from space, the Earth looked alive. 
However, it does not have its own eyes nor ears. We human beings advanced our technologies so that we can send satellites and even humans to space. And we can see the Earth from space with objective bird's eye view. By exploring the universe, we can learn a lot about our home planet. And it will lead us to save our spaceship the Earth. Thank you. Xie Xie. Thank you, Yaping and Naoko. I'm sure your stories will definitely inspire many others, especially the younger generation. While most of us are not able to travel to space now, we can still explore it through our imaginations. Science fiction is a great way to traverse the galaxy. So how does science fiction help the development of space exploration in real life? Let's welcome Zhang Disha, Chinese director and screenwriter, and Francesco Versal, multiple awards-winning author and editor of science fiction from Italy, to lead us into the world of sci-fi creation. Hello, Hello everyone. I'm director Zhang Disha. It's a great honor to be invited to participate in this great event on the meaningful day of the Space Day of China. When I was a child, my grandfather forced me to recite a tongue poem and the song relics. I remember a poem by Du Mu, a poet of the Tang Dynasty. It's called Ultimate Eve. The stone steps in the palace are as cool as cold water in the night. The palace maid look up at the starry sky on the stone steps, watching the cohort and the vega in the sky. Later, I also remember another poem from the Book of Sun. The three stars together are the waving sisters, and also through the stars, they finished their seven stages. At that time, there was a rooftop at my home, and my grandfather pointed out to me and told me the story of the a, a coal herd and the bathing maiden. When I recall it many years later, I found that the story, if that there were not for two stories in the sky, would this story have been lost long ago? So I really I find a science fiction. I have read a lot of science fiction books since junior high school. I like Arthur Clark, especially his 2001 A Space Odyssey. In the film work more than 50 years ago, the audience could find things like tablets, AI, and the driven technologies or our day-to-day -day scenarios. And also, we talk. I have the see another the a uh, novels as the a uh, foundation series and also i saw the uh, interview that uh, a uh, interview with elon musk he also said that these books giving him a strong sense of mission and that is why he founded spacex when i read mr liu since the three body problem it's really a uh, shock to me we talk about in there's a scene in China that when a person encounter a snake, try to hit the snake seven inches, which means to hit the vital point of the snake. Then, what is the so-called seven inches of a civilization? The answer from the novel is to hit the basic science. To lock up the civilization without the development of basic science is the same as giving this civilization a sailing. So another unique narrative, narrative of his science fiction is that he writes science fiction in the same way he writes history. He often sets up a person living in the future, and through this perception of looking back, he tells us a piece of human history. I realize that we don't need to surpass that classic works. That this book, The A Three Body Problem, told me that we need to find a universe and also standing on the reality to find a room of space. In 2019, the release of The Wandering Earth ushered in the first year of Chinese science fiction films. The accumulative box 
Office of Science Fiction Film in the Chinese film market that year reached a 19.511 billion yuan, with three science fiction films in the top 10 box office of the year, which was a very exciting start, different from the creative expression based on the nautical spirit in the Western science fiction movies we have seen before. The Chinese science fiction stories have very strong cultural symbols. and such as the homeland sentiment of taking the earth to wander in the film The Wandering Earth, a harmonious world of when the aliens come, invite them to drink in the film of Crazy Aliens. In my opinion, this is an expression of science fiction and thinking about the universe that we as a great civilization with a long history in the East have given to the world civilization. Right now, my team and I are also working on a piece of film in the science fiction industry. We talk about that. The, we could see that the space technology and cosmic exploration in the real world and the storytelling and the film making in the virtual world are intertwined in this process. I think that I was enlightened and found a wonderful connection between this small action in my science fiction film creation and China aerospace and the exploration of the universe. I believe this is a really connecting point so I translated all these into the background of my growing up and also to create the world that can understand as shared by mankind. And Mr. Xu Lai asked that what was the a very first story of mankind after some research and even the astronauts deduction An answer came out the first story was a story about the stars a hundred thousand years ago human ancestors in Africa made up a fairy tale called seven sister star they saw when they looked up into the sky it was told from generation after generation at the campfire accompanied by human beings through thousands of nights passed down to children to grandchildren and then taken to vast parts of the world and integrated into into the culture of different nations. Xu Lai finally said that this is the early story known to Man Canal, and it is also the most amazing and the grandest thing he has heard recently. This is a very touching story with a strong power that waves us together with our ancestors tens of thousands of years ago with lives on Earth and the celestial bodies in the vast universe and with the ups and downs of human civilization. Many of the seemingly ordinary things in our lives produce this ancient power. It makes us believe that the people all over the world once told the same story. Thank you. Well, Giao Francesco Verso. I'm an Italian science fiction writer and editor of Future Fiction. I'm really uh, thankful for this invitation by the China Global Television Network. And I'm going to give you a small talk about man and space. The relationship between humankind and space is ancient, and it has always been inspired by respect and domination. That unknown endless territory influenced many aspects of human life. Agriculture, navigation, engineering, just to name a few, are disciplines that required humans to turn their heads up and observe the sky and its functioning. It was often necessary to make a huge effort in the imagination and fantasy to get into that massive darkness and discover what was hidden behind the veil of those ethereal appearances. Geographical areas have followed each other without the humankind existing, but then, from its experience, it took just thousands of years before humankind could become aware of its position within the great fresco of the universe. From then on, humanity started to pose difficult questions, to doubt the very tissue of reality, to question the laws of physics, and thus to weigh fantastic narratives in order to explain what was unconceivable and unimaginable to the human mind. That's when science fiction was born. And that's where science fiction really comes from, from this never-ending process of asking why, of questioning the concreteness of present and to imagine what would happen if only things could go this way or that way, for good and for bad. When Jules Verne 
Back in 1865, imagine a cannon shooting a spacecraft to the moon. He couldn't possibly know about the spin launch, a suborbital accelerator able to really shoot payloads in orbit. The freedom of science fiction narrative allowed us to imagine the what if that makes us dream about space. This perception of infinite expansion, almost a spectrum of endless possibilities, which has often been accompanied by a sacred sense of respect for the sky and the universe, lasted for a very long time. And only in the last few centuries, when an anthropocentric vision of the world was imposed itself in many Western society, that a radical change in the relationship between man and space took place. Respect was replaced by desire of domination. Management became exploitation. Knowledge made room for poverty. And so science stripped the universe of its ancient mysteries, made it naked and defenseless against anyone who wanted to appropriate its resources. The industrial revolution of the 18th and 19th centuries established itself as a functional framework for predatory ecological abuse, and since then, everything changed. Efficiency, productivity, and unlimitless growth have become the mantras of modernity, in defiance of any other aspect of justice and principle of long-term sustainability. However, it is precisely science over the last decades that has eventually realized its immense power and responsibility towards space, and has attempted to remedy its ability to modify any situation without compensating for example, from engineering to trash space, from asteroid mining to low-orbit solar farms, and from 3D printing to, on exoplanets to generation space traveling. And as it has contributed to the formation of a widespread scientific awareness, a sort of mass environmental consciousness. The golden age of science colonization was a political rush to the stars, a scientific competition to fly as far as possible in order to put a flag on the moon and show it to the world. Now it seems a little different. We look at Mars as a potential second chance, a place to recover from the mistakes we did on Earth. But hopefully, the next golden age of space exploration will not be driven only by commercial rules and billionaires. We are in great need of a new ethic for space exploration. Just like we are in great need of a new ethic related to any scientific breakthrough that humanity is able to achieve. Space, like air, water and solar energy, is given to humanity and to all other species for free and thus it should be belong to everybody and to every other living beings. And as such, space should be treated as a common good for the good of the common beings. The space cannot become the scene for a new colonization simply changing the ships with the spaceships, the natives with the aliens, and the land colonization with space colonization. Here is where I see science fiction playing a big role, exploring with fantasy the what if of the space exploration that does not repeat the new world colonization of the 15th and 16th century. I personally come from the land of Galileo Galilei, whose stubborn desire to understand the laws of the universe caused him a great fame and a great risk at the same time. And I also come from the land of Astro Samantha, namely Samantha Cristoforetti, the first European female astronaut to go in space in 2009 and who will go soon again on the International Space Station to make experiments in physical sciences, human biology and physiology. Italians have been looking at space for centuries with curiosity. We need that curiosity to inspire more people. We need people like Galileo and Astro Samantha to inspire our next steps towards the stars. We need to broaden the horizon on both space exploration and science fiction narratives because I believe that in order to survive to the extreme conditions that we'll be exposed to in space, we need simply, we don't need simply augmented biology adaptive senses and cognitive enhancement, but we also need augmented wisdom, adaptive values and moral enhancement. Instead of aiming and appropriating the space as fast as possible, we should be aiming at appreciating the space as best as we can. 
we can be successful at exploring the space only if we explore ourselves and become better human beings. That would be a real change. That would be a real science fiction story. Thank you very much. Take care. Ciao. Well, thank you all for this great discussion. Humans have been dreaming of space for centuries. We have sent man to the moon, had robots land on Mars, and created space stations. But our desire to explore the universe continues to grow. With our imaginations and a curiosity, we can reach further in space and achieve our exploration dreams. Well, thanks for watching us on CGTN.com, Weibo, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and other social media platforms. I hope all of you enjoyed today's forum. I'm Yang Zhao in Beijing. Bye for now.